Download coming to you live from Church Milton headquarters here in Detroit, Michigan. All this week, we're presenting the download for free to give those of you who are not yet premium subscribers, notice we say yet, the opportunity to sample a show for the week to encourage you to sign up. Again, it's just $10 a month, and we'll say, because we've been saying it for 10 years, less than a cup of coffee a week. And for those of you who are premium subscribers, please feel free to offer whatever comments you want to encourage your fellow viewers to sign up. And why is it so important to be engaged and support the work of the apostolates that are faithful to the magisterium? Because there is a worldwide crisis of faith that has gripped the church, a loss of Catholic identity and self-understanding so vast that it has created chaos in the church. We've never seen anything like this before and on this kind of scale. Even the Protestant revolt of the 16th century pales in comparison. And things just keep accelerating, with the end result being massive confusion. Just a few days ago, Pope Francis issued a motu proprio deriving from his solemn authority that is causing great concern. And Brad is going to be filling us in on that and talking about why there is so much consternation over it. Christine is going to revisit the controversy surrounding Amoris Laetitia, especially in light of the deaths of two of the four cardinals who publicly signed it. And Simon is going to talk about specific church militant programming that addresses these confusions over the sacrament of marriage with a focus on a book written and released during the synods by faithful cardinals and bishops. So Brad, let's start with you. This is uh, uh, quite the cause for concern among uh, many Catholics who are saying, uh-oh. Yeah, it's another move of decentralization, downgrading Rome's authority and giving it out to the local bishops and uh, around the world in different areas. We saw it in, you know, in the past of his pontificate. Basically what happened was on Saturday, the Pope uh, Vatican released this uh, motu proprio by my authority. Uh, the Pope basically taking the uh, bull by the horns here and saying this is going to happen. And it was called Magnum Principium. And basically, it's, it's always titled from the first words, they start off, the great principle. And his great principle basically is Vatican II wants vernacular for the comprehension of the people in the liturgy. That's it. That's the great principle. So even though Vatican II said Latin shall be retained and only parts of it will be, we can get into that later. Anyway, in order to bring about the vernacular, you've got to have the bishops out in the conferences doing their thing. There's been a huge, for 50 years, struggle about bishops trying to do their thing and Rome reining them in. The bishops don't like it. The bishops in, uh, in the Council of Cardinals right now basically got the ear of the, uh, the Pope and saying, let's give more power to the bishops. They did that. Basically, Rome is out of the process pretty much as far as the back and forth goes with the different uh, uh, Episcopal conferences in devising, crafting their own translations and their adaptations. Uh, that adaptations kind of worries me even more than the translations. You know, think puppet masses and balloons going up at the liturgy in the last 50 years. And Rome comes in at the end and rubber stamps, kind of expected to give their confirmation at the end. That's kind of the way things are rolling out right now. Um, this return to decentralization uh, was actually um, decried by Paul VI, blessed uh, Pope Paul VI, as this auto-demolition of the church. John Paul II worked for most of his pontificate to rein in all of these, this post-Vatican II uh, Reformation era. And then uh, Benedict, uh, Emeritus Pope Benedict uh, XVI, solidified the liturgy by rooting it in the, trend, uh, the uh, tradition of the Roman Missal. Now this Roman Missal is shown here as an organic development in, from 33 AD to 1962 AD small iteration, small changes to the liturgy over centuries of time under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, nothing radical, no massive changes in short period of time, and always in obedience to church authority. Well, what the Pope has done here is basically removed the authority that you're going to be obedient to, so there isn't really a need to be obedient to authority. Uh, one of the early uh, uh, cheerleaders of this is uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, Blaise Supich. Now it's kind of interesting, you know, this, this 
uh, prolet, <laughs> um, is an advocate for giving uh, communion to uh, pro-abort politicians. You know, I don't want to uh, legislate at the, uh, the the altar the rail here, rail. communion rail. As you can see right there, and, the, the, the communion rail very visibly present. And, and also <laughs> give communion to the divorced and civilly remarried Catholics living in a state of mortal sin, and even to homosexual, active homosexuals. You know, who am I to judge type of thing? So he, he basically, this is the thing that's the problem here. He says this, this motu proprio sends a signal regarding the methodology, heavy-handed on the part of the Pope, that will be used in bringing about the other reforms, shiver, shiver, that are being considered by the Council of Cardinals. So basically the tail wagging the dog and the Pope is going to be the strong man making it through. So, uh, yeah, this decentralization is, is the problem here with this. The Pope says, well, you know, the faithful, the bishops have to be faithful, and Rome still is going to look at the end result and this type of thing. But, you know, look at Amoris Laetitia and things like that. So uh, Let's look at Amoris Laetitia. Yeah. You know, there were four cardinals who signed it, the dubia, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and now there are two. Now there are two. Yeah, in other big news, the, a second dubia cardinal has recently died, former Archbishop of Bologna, Italy, Cardinal Carlo Caffara. Before him was Cardinal Joachim Meisner, formerly of Cologne, Germany. Both of these were stalwart defenders of the faith. And of course, the dubia were the set of questions that were submitted to Pope Francis last year, asking to clarify his uh, apostolic exhortation of Mors Laetitia, which is his kind of thoughts on marriage and the sacraments. That has led to worldwide confusion on the idea of marriage and the sacraments. Diocese is interpreting Amor uh, Amoris Laetitia to mean that you can now give the sacraments Holy Communion to the divorced and civilly remarried, which you can't do. That's adultery. Jesus makes it clear. 2,000 years of church discipline and doctrine can't do it. But dioceses are pushing forward with this anyway, and it's leading souls to perdition. And so the dubia, this should be answered. Absolutely should be answered, but it has not been answered. How many more dubia cardinals have to die before, this, before the dubia are, are answered? But, I'm guessing none, yeah. because I don't think it's going to be answered. <laughs> yeah, but the point here is not so much to focus on the Pope, because we, we're very clear it needs to be answered. There wouldn't be so much confusion among the faithful if Catholics just knew their faith better. Catholics are woefully ignorant of their faith, and it's really a shame. The Catechism makes clear that Catholics are required to form their consciences. It says in paragraph 1783, quote, conscience must be informed and moral judgment enlightened. It says must, it doesn't say may, it's not an option. Catholics must inform their consciences. And how do you do that? You study the faith. You need to set aside time every single day, especially for those who don't know the faith very well. You have a moral obligation. God will call you to account on the day of judgment and you stand before him. You cannot hold up your hand and say, oh, well, I didn't know that was a sin. That's, that's not an excuse. You have the moral obligation to learn and study the faith, and that's what we try to do here at this apostolate. The whole point of this apostolate is to sh spread the light of the faith, enlighten and inform Catholics, and also the rest of the world on the truths of the Catholic faith, ultimately for your salvation. Yeah, lots of people don't like us doing that. We have protests. <laughs> we have but pro not very good ones. Yeah, yeah. Poorly organized, leftists, you know, they don't know what they're doing sort of protests, but aside from that, Simon, we've, uh, on this point, uh, you know, during the synod, uh, you know, Cardinal Burke and a number of other uh, cardinals and one of the archbishops actually wrote a book. Yes, yeah, they did. Uh, the book in question was called "Remaining in the Truth of Christ," uh, which is just a great title because clearly that's uh, what they were it's hoping <laughs> people would do uh, when they read the book. And the book is obviously to discussing all of the various problems and confusions that they thought might arise from the synod and did arise from the synod with regard to communion for divorced and remarried, communion for homosexuals, communion for fornicators etc 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 it's it's all of these kind of things communion for people who within the teaching of the church it very specifically says you can't have communion because communion would be poison to you and there's this confusion came up um, so what we did was we put together this show now a lot of uh, people they, they see you know especially when we're presenting uh, the commercials the adverts for the premium show we pick the things that are kind of the, the most fun the sort of the frothiest kind of materials possibly to show up there it's like it's it's entertaining in many ways and people have thought well is there really some meat there is there something there this particular show I think is the classic example example, um, uh, other than the formal 
classes that we have on the premium channel. It's a classic example of stuff that's deep, crunchy. The, the dogma lives loudly within it. Um, and, that's uh, a great expression. It's a great expression. I, I, I know. I'm thinking if I become a senator, I'm going to use that. Um, but um, but the, this really does go into a lot of depth, a lot of detail. It's, it's one of those shows that really uh, benefits from watching with one hand on the pause button, another hand on a notepad. Uh, we've got a little clip here. Uh, let's roll the tape. Knowing St. Paul's severe admonition against receiving Holy Communion in a state of mortal sin, the Church prudently withholds the Blessed Sacrament from those whose lifestyle is not in communion with her doctrine or practices. It's the actions or lifestyle that Holy Mother Church judges and not specifically the state of one's soul. Some disciplines can change, like how we do penance on Fridays, for example. Doing some penance, whether you eat meat or not, was always the main point. But some disciplines are doctrinal and can't be changed even if the church wanted to, such as adulterers not receiving the Blessed Eucharist. Adultery will always be objectively sinful, intrinsically evil, and the Eucharist must always be received worthily. Our Lord knew his children needed to be safeguarded from erroneous actions, so he entrusted them to the care of a loving mother, his holy bride, the church. And with her disciplines, she protects her children from adulterous unions and unworthy communions, both of which would spiritually ruin them. And so there's, you know, just a small excerpt from the show, uh, and it really, you know, you, you get the idea, you watch this, there is no confusion. It, it explains it in a great deal of detail, it goes through. Some of the other things, the point that Brad brought up, and my, my jaw just about hit the floor, this, this notion that the, uh, the, the, the Second Vatican Council calls for mass in the vernacular, uh, no, it doesn't yeah, yeah, at it doesn't. all. It, it um, introduces but that, some vernacular some in some vernacular, limited arguably, da, 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 da. However, all yeah. of that confusion, if you go out there and you ask 100 Catholics, probably 99 of them, if they've even heard of the Second Vatican Council, would agree, oh yes, that's what it does. No, it doesn't. We've got a show that addresses just that. The first season of Case Files addresses that and a bunch of other uh, of these uh, confusions. If you want, as Christine says, it's your responsibility and obligation to learn the faith so that you can uh, give these answers, so that you can be not confused, so that you can be clear. Um, the Church Milton Premium subscription isn't the only way to do it. To be honest, it's probably the best value. It's 10 bucks a month. And in today's society, People don't want to read anymore, you know, it's a, they, they, buying a book, it's an expensive thing, you've got to go through and trawl through and read it. Our videos, you can get them on your phone, they're like 20 minutes long, they will clear up your confusion. Another reason why you're going to need that is because uh, Lex Orande, Lex Credende, as you pray, so you believe. And with this motor proprio going through, let me tell you, uh, how you pray is probably going to change radically again. I, I, I liken to the uh, post-Vatican II Reformation era. Mm -hmm that happened from 1969, well, 67, 68, through about late 70s when John Paul II got in charge and tried to rein it all in. For that 10-year period, you're going to see that explosion again amongst the, amongst the bishops out there in the, you know, Germany couldn't get their translation through. Uh, they wouldn't work with Benedict XVI's uh, committees on this, and just recently their translation got rejected by the uh, uh, Congregation Divine Worship, who's in charge in Rome, to, to oversee that. With this process now, that's all going to be it's going to be different. And that's another reason why Catholics really, more than ever before, need to know their faith. It's not just for themselves, but it's also to respond right. to all these liberals. I mean, social media, everything. It's so you, as an informed Catholic, can respond to the falsehoods that are being put out there. You can argue coherently with other people and defend the faith. What you were saying right there, that you can respond, should be the reason you're studying more than anything. Uh, because you yourself should be rooted in the faith. You're not supposed to say, well, what if the Pope changes the Trinity and there's four persons in the Trinity tomorrow? Am I going to have... No. You're supposed to be solid in your faith. Why are you learning so much more? One, so you can stay in the church and be solid, but two, that you can reach out to everybody else. You have a lot more life preservers to throw out to people as they're yeah. falling off the bark of Peter. Yeah, gone are the days when you could just drop Don't your children. Father. Yeah, yeah. Father. gone are the days when you just kind of like go to <clears throat> drop your children off at Catholic school or at parish and expect them to get the education they need. No. If anything, they're getting heterodoxy. Yeah. And you you have the again, if you're a parent like me, that's another reason why you need to educate yourself because you've got to be able to pass that faith along to your children. A faith that never changes. Yeah, I mean there there is this issue and Simon we were talking about during the rehearsal that you know, you can go to 
you know, Catholics all over the country, and they all have their own sort of favorite, you know, pastime, hobby, whatever, which is fine. You know, I don't do it so much now because there's, you know, the demands of the apostle. But there was a time not so long ago uh, that, you know, I could tell you every single thing about Notre Dame football that season until Brian Kelly became coach and I lost interest. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I could tell you who the starting players were, they're this, and, uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, <clears throat> there comes a time, as St. Paul says, you know, when you grow up, you have to put, a, put aside childish things. I don't mean just, you know, complete completely, you know, abandon everything. It's perfectly all right to have your gardening or whatever. But the primary thing must be studying the faith. You um, have to know the faith. And we see so many people who will, you know, will say and they'll say to us, well, it's all right for you because that's what you do all day and you go through and da 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 You know, yeah, but why do we do this? Why do we do this? <laughs> and yes, we have the advantage that, you know, yeah, Brad, for example, gets to spend, you know, his 40 hours a week. He's on the show. He writes articles. He's researching for those articles. He, he has this knowledge. But it's not like Brad, before he turned up, was some guy sitting around with his thumb in his ear not knowing anything about the faith. Brad was very well versed in the faith because he had spent the time learning it because he was interested in it, because he wanted to know that as an important thing. Um, and this, this is the point. People need to divert their resources. And it's not just a question of, well, I pray for people. Yes, that's very good. Divert your prayer resources. And I volunteer and I do this. And that's very good. And you have those resources. And, you know, yes. But your intellectual resources, you know, you've got to use your intellect for these things. And as well, and this is crass, but your financial resources. If you're going around saying, I want to be educated, but you're not paying for any kind of educational materials, well, d do you really want to be educated? That's like saying, I want to be fit and healthy, but you know what, I, I, I never I'm go to the gym. I'm not gym membership. Yeah. I'm not, I expect it for free. There's yeah. nothing in life free. free. You know, in no. spiritual life or the temporal no. life, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, we do understand and respect people's busy schedules. Some people are extremely busy and they just, they can't devote as much time to it as we do here. That And we do have programs that offer, you know, specifically little bite-sized nuggets of things like Majesty of the Faith or other programs that are specifically kept short so that if you just have maybe a 15 minute slot, you can watch it and be informed in the faith and then, you know, go on about your day. Yeah. So. There is also the question of, you know, when we look at some of the, the programming that we have, how, you know, how dedicated might somebody be to saying, I'm going to set aside 15 minutes. You know, I'm, I am presuming that everybody who's watching us is setting aside some time for prayer every day. Excellent, amen, absolutely. But in these current circumstances, it isn't enough to just engage the soul on a, in a devotional way. You must also engage the mind because you go out into the world and there are thousands of attacks every day and they're packaged up and presented very intellectually, you know, on the surface. They seem to make sense. Why can't gays get married? You know, that's not fair. Other people can get married. Why can't they? And that's where it ends. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. It's all that. That's why, you know, we were in Washington, D.C. for the March for Life, I think, three years ago, four years ago. I mean, you know, we, we went out and interviewed, you know, various people. I, I can't remember what the numbers were now, but, you know, there should have not been a Catholic kid in that crowd. Who Any was of that we interviewed who was uh, in favor of contraception or in favor of gay marriage. And we found them. And we interviewed them, and of course, all the you know Church of Nice blogs are like, oh, they're all, all war socks, and all this is horrible yeah. thing, and oh, church militant, you know, stink, raising the stink pot again. We're not raising the stink pot, yeah. guys. <laughs> you yeah, need to know the faith, and they won't know the faith. Yeah, it's not enough. Like you said, it's not enough just to be pious and have your devotionals. You need that absolutely. We just got an email yesterday from someone who said that he was a bit shocked because one of the most pious, most devout women at his parish. Who, who goes to adoration all the time and prays all the time, is at mass all the time, uh, very pious, very devout. She doesn't believe the Catholic Church is the one true faith established by Jesus Christ, and therefore she thinks that everyone else is just going to be so saved. So why do you win it? So yeah. it's, well, it's not enough so for you. Yeah, it's not <laughs> enough for you to pray. You've got to yeah. know the yeah. faith. Yeah, this is one of the things also. I mean, you know, we, I was talking to a priest friend you know, a couple of years ago, and he made the very cool observation. I thought, hmm, that stuck with me. He said, you know, people in the face of crises, sometimes in the church, will retreat into piety. And they'll sort of find a little safe sanctuary there. I know a woman who, you know, I, I met years ago, uh, who had the, I think it was either 2 o'clock to 3 or 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock hour in the morning, Eucharistic adoration. I, I, I don't know if it was every day or once a week, but anyway, it was certainly, you know, a noteworthy, uh, you know, uh, uh, devotional practice. She's pro-abortion. Yeah. She had been doing this for 16 years. Mm. So at some point you have to say to yourself, 
Is this piety really the piety, one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? Or is this a, some psychological thing that you, with your personality, just seem to, you know, the, for whatever, it suits your personality, so you participate in it? Clearly, it isn't. Whatever that was is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. No. So it's not one of the seven gifts. It's, uh, you, you know, you, you have to check all this. And the way you measure, the way you measure your faith is how, your supernatural faith, is how much does it conform to the truth of Christ? remaining in the truth of Christ. If it does not, then whatever you've got going on that you think is religious or pious or something is not. Yeah. It's the deception of the devil. Yeah. It's just that simple. There's one thing that I want to bring up. This, this is inspired by a friend of mine who was at the USCCB conference, or one USCCB conference or some laity conference related to this weekend, and he got chewed up and spat out by a bunch of, you know, sophisticated church and nice people. So pray for him because he's feeling rather bad. But to Brad's point, these liturgical changes. They're going to come down the pike and the Church of Nice is going to be like, let's go out and ask the people. Let's go out and find out what the people are. To Christine's point, the people need to be educated. The people is you out there watching this. You need to be educated so that you can go in and be going, no, those changes you're suggesting are not. In the, the heart of every good crisis is an opportunity. Chaos is a ladder. This is how to climb it. That's exactly right. We're running, we're running out of time. Totally running I'm sure you've got time. a great point, but you can save it for tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> if you like this discussion, these types of discussion, we do this every weekday live here at 1030 Eastern Time. And of course on playback for the rest of the day for your viewing. The download is built around the idea that there are many things going on in the world that are of interest to and impact Catholics. So the panel here pulls out an authentically Catholic microscope, closely examines these various things culturally, politically, theologically to help you understand the relevance of all of this to the church. The church does not exist in a vacuum. There are human agents doing the work of their master, knowingly or not, trying to undo the truth of Christ present in his holy church. Their goal may or may not be the destruction of the souls of your loved ones, but it most definitely is the goal of their master, the demon, who they follow. You need to be as informed as you can possibly be so you can engage in spiritual warfare, as we said, not just in the spiritual realm, but also in the temporal. That's what we do here each and every day for you, weekdays, Monday through Friday, for roughly 20 minutes. So if you are not yet a premium member, please become one and learn about all these things so you can be the most informed and then hopefully holy Catholic you can be as you move about the world trying to save other souls in addition, of course, to your own. That's it for today. Please come back tomorrow for the most well-informed discussion in the whole Catholic media world. And remember, this week, this sampling and download is free every day. God love you.